Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me. I apologize for getting off to a late start. Um, our fearless leader and uh, curator of the MythGuard Academy guest speaker series had a computer crash there and we were trying to get her back online, but I don't think that's going to work, unfortunately, so I will simply introduce myself. First of all, it is wonderful to have you here. Thank you all so much. Uh, for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. It's a delight. And I do hope you will check more of the lectures for the Mythgard Academy guest lecture series. There are other speakers who will be coming up here in the fall, and then they'll be coming back again in the year two of the series. I hope you will uh, consider joining those other speakers as well. There have been some terrific speakers thus far, big shoes for me to fill. So I'm very honored and I feel quite privileged to be a part of this. So thank you for joining me. I am Dr. Amy H. Sturgis. If you weren't here to hear me, you can leave now <laughs> because you're in the wrong place. But if you are, I'm delighted that you are here. I have been with Mythgard Institute at Signal University for several years now, and I will be teaching this fall a course called The Force of Star Wars. And in that class, we will be examining the epic for 12 weeks. That is an online course. People are welcome to take part in live interactive lectures or download them after the fact and in enjoy those or consume those at, uh, at your leisure. And I do hope you'll consider joining us for that as well. If you're interested in knowing more about me, I believe there was a, a, bio, a biographical statement there of me on the main page. You can also go to amyhsturgis.com and find out a bit more about me. But you're here to talk about Star Wars, I do hope. So why don't I just go ahead and dive in? I do have one quick disclaimer before I begin my talk, and that is, as I just mentioned, I am getting ready to teach a 12-week course, and that means talking about Star Wars for a good 36 hours, which means anything I say today for my topic is just the tip of a very large iceberg. The Star Wars saga has drawn upon and continues to draw on a worldwide storytelling legacy that covers many, many years, in fact, centuries, and of course covers uh, a global uh, inspirational base there. So anything that I talk about today will be just just the tip of the iceberg. And I'm only actually going to talk about a couple of the inspirations uh, for Star Wars today. And even so, the portrait that I paint will be with very broad strokes. So please know I don't intend my comments to be comprehensive or exhaustive, but I do hope they're entertaining and edifying. I'm very much looking forward to talking about this with you. So with that disclaimer, let's dive in, shall we? All right. When I started preparing this talk, I asked myself, when I close my eyes and think about Star Wars, what is the first visual that I see? Now, lots of ideas come to mind. I am a first-generation Star Wars fan. I was very fortunate that my parents allowed me to go not once, but six times when I was a small thing, not yet a kindergartner, uh, to go and see what I thought of as my very first adult film, that is non-Disney film. Of course, the irony is I'm an adult now and Star Wars is Disney. But at any rate, I got to go there in the theater in 1977. My mind was blown, my world was expanded, and Star Wars became one of a handful of very important texts that really changed my life and set me on the path that I'm continuing to follow today as a scholar of intellectual history, tracing ideas, and particularly tracing ideas through the tradition of science fiction. So a lot of ideas come to mind, but in particular, one chat, uh, I'm sorry, one, um, <laughs> I just looked at the chat there. Hey, that's, that's what you call the Jedi mind trick working on me, right? Um, one particular image comes to mind very quickly when I, when I think of Star Wars, and that is the image of Luke Skywalker on Tatooine, looking out across the vast waste, just sand dunes, no one in vision, no one in sight. He's just there looking up, looking out at the sand and looking up at the sky. The binary suns are there beginning to set. It's just Luke and the setting, right? 
And those of you who know it well can imagine in your mind even the music, right? Da 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 da, and the the air is, is blowing, and he's you know his his hair is going back, and he's looking up there. And there's a lot going on in that particular moment. There is this small individual and this vast space. Actually, vast space in a couple of ways. Vast space in the sense of, of this desert that just goes on and on and on. And space in the sense that he's looking at the sky and beyond it, imagining the stars where he wants to be. He is in inhospitable starkness. He is a lone individual. He is by himself, isolated, yearning. You can just feel inside of him uh, the sense that he's tethered, that he doesn't want to be there, that he wants to step out into a, to a broader world, that, that he's small and the world around him is, is large, right? And this conveys an awful lot without ever even giving us dialogue without giving us backstory, just looking at this image tells us a great deal. There's lots that we can read from this, and before, as sort of a preface to my larger talk, I would like to unpack the visuals here for just a moment. For someone who studies film or someone who studies the films particularly of George Lucas, you might look at this and say, well, this is a particular type of, of, of cinema storytelling, right? And knowing that George Lucas in film school was introduced to the films of Akira Kurosawa, that he loved those films, you can certainly see a connection there, an influence of Kurosawa's cinematographic style. In fact, he was deeply interested in Kurosawa's films. He tried to option the rights uh, to remake uh, The Hidden Fortress, one of Kurosawa's films. Incidentally, in the, the Hidden Fortress, it tells the story of a young princess on the run, being hunted, fleeing for her life, with only a general there for her protection. Uh, shades of Leia Organa, shades of Padme Amidala. It also tells the story from the point of view of the two lowliest characters in the film to peasants who bicker back and forth with each other. They are good-natured, even though they're, they're constantly ribbing each other and making fun of each other. And really, um, what you see is the inspiration there for George Lucas's choice to tell Star Wars, in a way, from the perspective of R2-D2 and C-3PO. In fact, the early scenes of The Hidden Fortress, the music that's playing as those two peasants walk along what's essentially a vast wasteland is the same almost exact music you hear when C-3PO and R2-D2 find themselves on Tatooine and are trying to figure out if they're going to go this way or that way or split up exactly uh, in the same style as those peasants. But I digress. Kurosawa was known for the same kind of big picture, right? Where you have the vast setting and the small individual. Often the small individual there was his leading man of choice, uh, Toshiro Mufune, who would portray the um, samurai character, uh, whichever samurai character the story was about, often in the same kind of situation, staring out at the vastness, uh, a bit wistful, a bit defiant, and clearly contextualized by the inhospitable surroundings in which he found himself. Nice parallel there. If we go backwards, we find that Kurosawa was in fact influenced by the great director of U.S. Westerns, John Ford, and his leading man of choice, John Wayne. In Ford's classic films, you often saw the same kind of setup, right? You had John Wayne looking out over the vast, often, desert. You had the, the notion of the individual pitted against these circumstances, larger than was. Uh, a wistfulness, also a kind of defiance, a kind of yearning, too. There, very clear, you see the, the Western storytelling then becoming uh, the, the samurai storytelling of, 
of Kurosawa. And so interesting connections going back. If we go forward, there is also some interesting things to think about. For example, um, again, Mifune, his samurai characters, who would often come into a situation with no backstory, being completely uh, mysterious, this new added dimension to whatever scenario was already playing out, would right wrongs, would take care of business, and then would leave becoming in a way more legend than history because really in terms of history what facts do people know about him not a whole lot he was a man of few words a man of great and decisive action and then in the end he would go off into the sunset well those characters in the kurosawa films that mifune embodied would go on to inspire another actor clint eastwood in creating one of his most iconic characters, the man with no name, in a series of westerns that he starred in for the great Sergio Leone. In fact, one of uh, the, the trilogy of, of uh, man with no name films is essentially a retelling of um, Kurosawa's film Yojimbo, that was A Fistful of Dollars, the first of those three films. And then a few dollars more, and the good and the bad and the ugly, all part of this cycle of storytelling that is really U.S. Western via Italy. They were called spaghetti westerns because they were, in fact, filmed in Italy. Through the Japanese lens of Kurosawa back to the American perspective of Ford. But if you hadn't had Kurosawa thinking about Ford, you wouldn't have had Sergio Leone and Clint Eastwood thinking about Kurosawa. To bring this full circle then, it's no coincidence that one of the best, best received, and I think best aesthetically speaking, and, and one of the best selling for that matter, Star Wars novels is the 2012 novel Kenobi by John Jackson Miller. What is that? It is a Star Wars Western, and it casts as the man with no name the cowboy, if you will, who rides into town, rights wrongs, takes care of business, rides out again, leaving complete mystery in his wake, Obi-Wan Kenobi on Tatooine. In that crucial period of time, this transition period, when he is no longer Jedi Master Kenobi, but he's not yet crazy old Ben who lives out in the dunes. He has given up the infant Luke Skywalker to be raised by the Lars family. He is trying to negotiate what it means to just be a bystander and a watcher from afar. Uh, he has to protect Luke, of course, but he's been a man of action for a long time and he's been trained to intervene for those who cannot fight for themselves. And how does he sort of reconfigure himself to be able uh, to hide out essentially and lay low until until Luke is of age. So this story is a Sergio Leone spaghetti western Star Wars story. It's very very effective and it gives us scenes of Obi-Wan Kenobi that look just like this. That look just like Luke Skywalker looking up at the binary suns as they're beginning to set on Tatooine, looking out at the vastness of the landscape, a small individual, a, a, a huge, inhospitable world in which he is yearning to break free, to move to some other vaster, wider place, some place he can act and become himself. A Star Wars story through through uh, Italian interpretations of Western, through Japanese samurai stories, back to U.S. Westerns again. The visual storytelling and part of the meat of the story as well coming from these ideas. So I throw this uh, up as a preface so that, uh, that now I can dive into why I think all of this is significant. I think it's very... Uh, fitting that we think of John Ford and Akira Kurosawa and Sergio Leone when, and for that matter John Jackson Miller and of course George Lucas when we look at this image. It's fitting because science fiction pulps 
are one of the literary traditions, one of the main literary traditions that inform Star Wars. And we don't have science fiction pulse without the Western. So let us begin then. First of all, what do I mean when I say pulps? Well, during and immediately after the United States Civil War, there was a kind of revolution in American publishing. This was in part due to the fact that there was widespread interest around the country in reports about the battles, about the struggles, about the, the political decision making, everything that was going on surrounding the Civil War. So this meant being able to get stories different places quickly. More importantly, it meant cheap publication and vast distribution. Cheaper printing, wider distribution, and on top of that, the widespread prevalence of, if not well-educated, at least literate members of not only the upper class or upper middle class, but uh, the working class as well. This leads, after the Civil War, to the phenomenon of pulp fiction, called pulp because it was printed on a very inexpensive pulp paper. These are the what you think of as dime novels. They were very inexpensive. They were meant to be disposable reading. You didn't save a pulp novel, and if you did, you would be really disappointed because you go back and try to read that thing 20 years later and it would just crumble to dust in your hand. It wasn't meant to survive. It was meant to be read and tossed over your shoulder or maybe handed to your friend who would then throw it over his or her shoulder. There are certain things that followed from that. For example, on the one hand, these stories would be somewhat formulaic. Nobody was going to take volume one and volume 30 and compare them paragraph by paragraph and see if you didn't reuse some of the same ideas over and over again. These authors were paid by the word. Hey, if you could recycle some of those words, all the better, right? But at the same time, even though these episodic stories were often doing the same things over and over again, there was a built-in requirement to up the ante right? You wanted to get more of the same, but you also wanted to up the stakes because you've already seen one thing happen. Well, they've already gotten out of that kind of danger before. It's got to be a little more dangerous. It's got to be a little more daring to make the action bring readers back again and again. These were stories about the West. Now, sometimes these were about fictional characters. Sometimes, ostensibly, they were about historical characters, but to be honest, these were still pretty much fictional stories as well. The real characters normally didn't really uh, represent those individuals at all. They were simply licensed to tell a story and use a name that people already recognized. There were bad guys, and those bad guys varied from book to book. They might be white outlaws, they might be uh, Mexican banditos, they might be Native American warriors, whatever. It was going to probably change. You sort of take out one um, threat and put in another one and again and again tell the same kind of stories. But it was exotic because it was in the West. It was exotic because uh, things happened that didn't happen uh, in cozy homesteads where people presumably were often reading these. And it was also um, aimed at young readers, young readers who might be more credulous about depictions of the West uh, because if they hadn't lived it, they might not uh, in fact know that these things didn't happen all the time. But they were also aimed toward young people because they were fast paced they were action-oriented, they were exciting, and the protagonists often were young as well. In fact, uh, you, they were tween, teen, very young adults who were the savers of the day over and over again. These would become informed by the first-hand accounts which, to be fair, often had their own degree of fiction, let's be honest, in them, the first-hand accounts of life as 
cowboys life as rough riding action guys of the the frontier that began to be published the most important of these stories really the first autobiography that took the american imagination by storm became a bestseller it's never been out of print since it started its first best-selling edition a texas cowboy or 15 years on the hurricane deck of a spanish pony by charles a siringo or charlie siringo as he liked to go by he lived from 1855 to 1928 and his autobiography was first published in 1885. There are some interesting major themes in this uh, autobiography, and I should say there's more veracity to this one than some of those that came later. Although there are some tall tales, he gets very um, free with the facts when he talks about Billy the Kid and such, but when he talks about his own life, there's enough of a record about him. He went on to become a Pinkerton agent and such, and you can follow up on his historical trail. Uh, there's enough there to verify a lot of the things that he talks about. There are several themes that emerge from Charlie Seringo's story. First, he's a green, inexperienced youth, barely a teenager, when he sets off into a wild, wider, and a wilder too, world to make something of his life. There's nothing left for him at home. He's going to go out and try, uh, try to see what the world has to offer him. He is every bit as inexperienced as Luke Skywalker was staring up at that sunset with the binary suns. There is a clear demarcation in this story and later, of course, in the pulps, and also at the same time in the pulps. The pulps are simultaneous with this. Um, you can see this in Seringo's story and in the pulp westerns as well. A clear demarcation between the good guys and the bad guys. Now that's not because the good guys were always doing good things and the bad guys were always doing bad things. For example, there is an extended section, and then he revisits it several times, about cattle theft. He worked for years as a cowboy who helped take the cattle of large cattle owners, um, ride them up uh, the free range in the middle of uh, the United States up to market. They would, uh, there would be a number of cowboys for these um, long cattle drives. And a ways over, there would be a whole bunch of cowboys working for another uh, rancher, driving that rancher's cattle as well. And he would talk a lot about the, drama behind that group stealing some of your cattle, not yours, right? They were the ranchers for whom you worked. Uh, you, your group stealing some of their cattle, going back and forth. This was, it required some finesse uh, because you'd have to do it under the noses of the other cowboys. You uh, also had to figure out how to finesse the um, uh, branding. Once, once you branded a cow, uh, uh, then that cow was clearly the belonged to the owner whose brand that was. So you had to figure out how to sort of change the brand and then claim that's a completely different brand. That means it's not uh, a cow that belongs to this particular owner. And he talks about this with real admiration for his own cleverness when he does it. Sometimes the cowboys would steal cows from their own uh, ranchers and set up their own little cattle enterprise separately. Take five here, five there, and, and sort of set up their own little side business as it were. Sometimes the other guys would steal from them, and instead of this becoming a terrible blood feud, there was much more the sense of, ah, well played, sir. Next year, I will steal your cattle. These were scoundrels. These were the Han Solos and Lando Calrissians of the prairie. Uh, they were clearly doing something immoral, they were stealing. They were doing something illegal, they were stealing. And yet, it's, it's told about with such uh, self-congratulation and such humor and even when he was on the the losing side of an equation like that some some appreciation for the artistry involved in that sort of con that that the reader can't help but root for these guys even though they're doing something bad conversely steal a man's horse this is a very serious business Steal 20 cattle, that's one thing, but steal one horse, that's something else. Because if you steal a person's horse, that is, in a way, committing murder. And not a nice, clean, merciful murder like putting a bullet through someone's head. You're com 
condemning someone to terrible, long, lingering death, a possible exposure or thirst or who knows what, if they have to walk uh, on foot to the next uh, settlement. And so there are examples of the whole community of cowboys getting together and saying, we all have to agree to this. This is a code we're all going to live by. That guy stole a horse. He, we can't ever see him again. Tell him to leave. If we ever see him again, his life is forfeit. And everyone agreeing to that because you have to take this kind of stuff seriously. And if that means everyone getting together and agreeing to hang someone, that's what you have to do if that's the consensus because you can't have people murdering each other like this. And so there are stories like this too that, that make you think they're living by a particular kind of code even though they are scoundrels. There's also this abiding sense of, if not us, then who? There's no greater authority, there's no government, there's no leader, there's no organization or institution of any kind that's going to come in and make things right. If something goes wrong, you have to take care of it. Uh, the, the horse thief is, is an example of that. Those cowboys have to get together, agree what the right thing to do is, and do it. Uh, an, an example that he doesn't actually spend much time on in his, his autobiography, I think is one of the, by far the most interesting things in any of the stories at this time. He clearly didn't think of it as that big a deal, but it really is when you look back on it. A group of cowboys, they just got paid, they're on their way uh, back to their um, employers, but they want to have a little party on the side before they get there. They're looking to, well, drink, womanize, gamble, all of these, uh, you know, indulge all their vices because they have some money in their pockets. They're in the middle of a sort of unfamiliar terrain. They come across this town, and it turns out this town was created by some rather conservative religious folks who were trying to find a place where they could live good, upstanding lives and have a, a clean, decent town, right, which just really disappoints the cowboys completely. There is no saloon, there is no brothel, there's not even a card game in sight. They can't have any of the crazy fun that they were expecting. But they also find something else, and that is a group of ruffians who came across the town before they did. And these ruffians also, likewise disgusted by the lack of any sort of vice they can indulge in, decide they're going to have some fun with the locals. And so they shoot a few places up, they light a few fires, and they terrify the citizens. And so the cowboys, who have no kinship to these people, it's certainly not a place they want to stay, um, have a tremendous respect for the fact that this is what the frontier is supposed to be. People are supposed to go out and build the lives they want. These people aren't hurting anybody. These people have every right in the world to create a community that looks like the kind of community they want to have. And ruffians shouldn't come in and shoot their stuff and burn their stuff and give them problems over it. And so at great personal risk to themselves, the cowboys get together and run the ruffians out. And he doesn't seem to think that's, a, that's an unusual thing. It comes back to the point, if we don't do something, who will? These locals were far too peaceful and not organized enough uh, and not armed enough, let's be honest, to be able to defend themselves. If we're not going to do it, who will? Well, then we have to do it. And so this sort of call to heroism for normal everyday people who are just off doing their own thing. They might be, oh, I don't know, um, uh, running a illegal contraband for job at the hut. <laughs> they might be just, you know, farming moisture on Tatooine. They're doing their own thing. And suddenly they're asked to step up and play a much, much bigger role. Because if they don't, who will? Surely, slowly, but surely, the U.S. frontier became less about the Wild West, though, and more about another new land, an intellectual land, a land of invention, of science, of technology. As the decades progressed, young persons became interested in not just uncharted wild lands. Of course, the frontier was in the process of diminishing. the The West frontier, in, Western frontier in the United States, was was uh, being circumscribed by, by new states, by new fences, by new farms, the, the free range, the open land just wasn't there like it had been. But the idea of undiscovered intellectual countries made possible by the rapidly changing science of the era 
opened completely new vistas, new frontiers for young people. And there was a poster boy, a homegrown hero who embodied this. And overnight, young people didn't want to be Charlie Seringo anymore. They wanted to be Thomas Edison. Thomas Alva Edison uh, lived from 1847 to 1931. He was an American inventor and businessman. We owe him tremendously for the long-lasting practical things that he brought to us, like the electric light bulb, the phonograph, and particularly, since we're talking about Star Wars, which began as films, uh, the motion picture camera. He was a prolific uh, inventor with something like 1,093, I think it was, U.S. patents to his name and patents in the United Kingdom, in France, in Germany. The impact of his inventions really changed the entire uh, atmosphere uh, and and scenery of the late nineteenth and I'm sorry late <laughs> late nineteen uh, hundreds uh, and early twentieth uh, 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 century um, from the late sorry late eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds. Um, I'll get it right in a minute. What he did, essentially, wasn't just create things that got people excited. He created things that changed their lives on a daily basis, that came into their homes and made the way they live completely different. Uh, the electric light and power utilities, sound recording, motion pictures, these didn't just just uh, have ripple effects in scientific communities. These created entire industries that then changed the way that people lived. He was dubbed the Wizard of Menlo Park, one of the first inventors to apply the principles of mass production and large-scale teamwork, uh, not only to the, to the production of his inventions, but to the creation of inventions. He's created with the creation of the first industrial research laboratory. That is, where people were brought to become inventors. This spot is where we are going to invent things, right? And all of the investment he put into his laboratory, actually laboratories, that made new inventions possible. And he became uh, a fascination for the media. Even while he was alive, he was as much myth and legend as he was real man. Because Edison, just the last name, evoked all sorts of ideas about a new world coming into creation that changed the way people's, again, people's homes, people's cities, the way the whole landscape looked. He was, in a sense, a popular hero. And so suddenly, U.S. adolescents didn't want to be a cowboy. They wanted to be an inventor. And the frontier they wanted to set off into and tame and make their own was science. And as a result, the Western pulp got changed. The stock Western figures were simply removed. The stories themselves did not change all that much. But the stock ingredients of the Western were changed, removed, and then replaced by ingredients that said science. Not No, they didn't say science. They said science with an exclamation point after. The first great example of the change of pulps comes from the steam man of the prairies, um, this, uh, which was published by No Name. It was a, an anonymous publication. Um, the end of the, the uh, uh, 1900s there, you see, I'm trying to say it again, the end of the 1800s there, um, you see this suddenly, you can, you can see even from the illustration there, what you would have had was a carriage uh, that was led by horses whose you know, nostrils were going to be breathing um, all sorts of, of, you know, steam and fire, and they would be running across the plains. You have prairies here. This is still in the West, still on the frontier. And yet suddenly what you have is a steam-driven automaton. This is a robot 
right? This is like a proto-android. This character is a machine and it is mobile and it is moving and it has been invented and now it is taking the place of something that has been ubiquitous, right? The horse horse uh, driven carriage and instead you have new technology changing the way people live. After the steam man of the prairies you see a lot more of these pulp stories that are again pieces of technology put in, science put in. You have Frank Reed the Frank Reed series uh, would become a total of 184 novels over 23 years um, that would run into the beginning of the 20th century. Frank Reed would have his own steam man of the plains, not the prairies. One word switch there, but everything else pretty much of the same thing. That would tell stories that had, again, young people um, who were the heroes who were saving the day that had uh, clearly bad guys. You didn't have to figure out, oh, the moral ambiguity here, here. I wonder who I should sympathize for and root for. No, you clearly knew who you were rooting for. You knew who the bad guys were. You knew who the good guys were. And you knew the good guys were going to be daring and clever and save the day. But this time they wouldn't do it with their um, six gun. This time they wouldn't do it in a, with their lasso. They would do it with a piece of technology. There would follow from the incredibly uh, uh, successful Frank Reed stories a lot of other pulps that were telling what were clearly westerns, but now all of a sudden you have the technology and you also change the setting. Other exotic settings. Maybe it isn't uh, the western territories, maybe it's Mars. Maybe it's Venus, maybe it's the moon. And suddenly you have more and more science fiction creeping into these tales that still have the same um, sort of episodic, action-oriented, um, repetitive <laughs> uh, kinds of, of storytelling in, in play, but you have a shift away from what young people, and again, young people, Tweens, teens, young adults are still the main purchasers, main readers, main consumers of these works. Scholars who look back at this say what we have is a kind of object fetishism. What do they mean? They mean that technology becomes a character in its own right. And the stories revolve around the technology that the, the young protagonists either create, their inventors, or make better. Here's something we've had all along, but this young person has the vision to tweak it, and now it does this. And this makes it much, much, much better than what all these other people have. And so now he can go right wrongs and do great things and take care of business. You have steam men, steam horses, electric airships, electric battle wagons, all kinds of things coming out of these stories. And what are these stories known as? Retroactively, now that scholars look at them and try to sort of pinpoint them where they fit, there is a clear term that works, and that term is Edisonade. Now this goes all the way back to how scholars like to take uh, Jeremiah um, from the Bible and say stories like Jeremiah, uh, stories that, for example, critique the social situation at the time, we call those Jeremiads. Then you get to Robinson Crusoe and you say, hmm, there's an awful lot of stories like this after we get Robinson Crusoe where people get stranded someplace, isolated, and they've got to create a whole little civilization for themselves. We'll call those Robinson Aids. Well, you get to these pulps, the pulps that go from Western to science fiction, and they become the Edison Aid. The Edison Aid uh, was coined by, in 1993, uh, by Clue Nichols for their great encyclopedia of science fiction based around characters modeled on and and making a hero of Thomas Edison. What does this mean? Young people who have an affinity for technology. They are inventors or if not inventors they have such a natural gift with technology that they can take things, fix them, and make them better than they ever ever were. These kinds of stories um, would create the technology as a centerpiece, as a, a main plot point, as a main character in the stories. 
and they mean not only that the young person is going to win the day, he's going to right wrongs and such because of this technology he either invented or made better, but also it becomes a sort of rite of passage. It means that this young person then has the ability to, and here I'm going to quote Clute and Nichols, light out for the territory. What does that mean? It means, in essence, this young person now has a key to a much bigger, wider future because that young person masters technology and shows himself himself originally, but also soon by the 19 teens herself as well, um, an affinity with uh, and, and, a, and a familiarity with and a comfort with and a confidence with technology. So his or her credentials, in essence, are tied up in how that person can use technology. The fetishism of the artifact, um, that piece of technology being at the center, gives the young person, in other words, that first step into a wider world. And yes, when I say first step into a wider world, well, I'm talking about Obi-Wan Kenobi giving Luke Skywalker that uh, lightsaber his father used to have. It, it, this is all tied up in the notion that part of what technology gives you is mobility, which is a very, very, um, in some senses, in terms of literature, a very um, American phenomenon. Mobility is at the heart of the cowboy story. It's important that you can pick up and go anywhere at any time. And being mobile, being able to traverse wide distances on your own competently, get there and back again safely, and show that no matter where you are, you're the master of the situation. That's a very important thing. Uh, now mobility uh, comes through technology. And just as a quick aside, I'm clearly getting very carried away here. <laughs> I need to reel myself in so I don't go too far over time. I would certainly want to take Q&A too. Um, it's, not, it's not a coincidence that one of the ways the Edison aid gets transmuted by the 1950s is in car culture. That young people who take automobiles and cruise around um, in, in cities and in small towns all around uh, the United States. It's not just enough that you have a nice car, you need to have tinkered with it, somehow um, uh, uh, made it uh, special, somehow made it uh, better than it was originally created to be. It can run faster, it, its lights look different, right? Um, in, in a sense, um, tailoring it and, and, and making it um, uh, personalized to one's own personality to show that you've mastered the car and then drive around and show other people your car and then maybe uh, race those people. This is the culture in which George Lucas grew up. This is the culture that deeply influenced him and led him to create the movie American Graffiti, all about the cruising culture. This is about mobility, um, the young person in the car, uh, uh, a, a marriage made with the Edison aid, if you will, and this will show up again and again in Lucas's films. The whole pod race thing, the whole notion of, um, yes, but Han Solo made the Millennium Falcon even better than Londo had. Well, this is tied up in the cruising culture, which also goes all the way back to the Edison aid. Okay, I am pulling Sturgis back to the main point. There's several ways to look at the Edison Aid in relationship to Star Wars. There's this special affinity for and gift with technology that opens the door to a wider world, lighting up the territory. Think Anakin Skywalker in Episode One, The Phantom Menace. How do we know the Force is strong with him and that he's quite possibly the chosen one? I'm going to draw here on the scholarship of Paul F. MacDonald and say, don't let the talk of midichlorians fool you. It's the midichlorians have a role to play, but they're given very, very, very short shrift in the film. The way you know that there's something special with Anakin Skywalker is A, he has a skill in fixing anything. Everybody knows it. That's why he's so valuable to Watto. He races his pod race at a freakishly, I'm sorry, his pod in the pod race. Um, at a freakishly young age, and he beats these people who have been uh, racing for a very long time. This allows not only Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi to continue with their, um, their 
assignment with, uh, with Queen Amidala, but it also buys him a ticket out of slavery, off the planet into a much, much wider world. His flying of the fighter at the end of the film and taking down the Federation droid control ship, which basically then completely ends all of the battle droids. It just turns them all off and there the entire battle is over. In a move that's not unlike his son's at the end of Star Wars A New Hope, the very first Star Wars film, where Luke is there in the trenches going for that one in a million shot against the Death Star that's going to start the chain reaction that blows up the Death Star. In both cases, they make it. Even seasoned pilots in uh, the first Star Wars film in A New Hope say, you can't make a shot like that. And Luke Skywalker says, I used to bullseye womps rat, uh, womp rats uh, back in Beggar's Canyon back home, and, and they, they were the same size. I can do this easily. He doesn't even realize, in comparison, how gifted a pilot he is. This affinity with technology shows us these characters are heroes, and it also buys them entrance into a much larger world. And then, of course, the lightsaber as a unique creation of the Jedi. Every young Jedi, uh, Jedi in a way, is Thomas Edison because every young Jedi in the last coming of age before becoming a knight has to create his or her own lightsaber, right? The color is different based on the crystal. Uh, it requires meditation and isolation. It's, it's a very important um, bit of identity that this is going to be a specialized uh, weapon for a particular individual Jedi to use. There are other differences. Um, that reflect this kind of personalization. If Count Dooku, uh, who uh, originally was a Jedi Master before he goes Sith, has this um, single-bladed uh, lightsaber with a pistol grip that, in fact, is, is kind of associated with real-world fencing. It certainly fits his personality and his fighting style. It's very much personalized to him. Um, Ezra Bridger, Jedi in training in Star Wars, um, the uh, the Rebels television series, he has this, he's an orphan street rat who essentially has had to make do with stuff that he finds all of his life. He cobbles together his lightsaber with parts from blasters, so he ends up with this blaster lightsaber thing. Again, this is very much unique to him. Um, Luke's skill with his father's lightsaber, and then the fact that his own lightsaber is in fact different, even different in color from, from his father's. What we've seen already in, in the trailers and behind the scenes footage from Star Wars The Force Awakens uh, suggests that this fetishism of the technology, the personalization of the, the lightsaber is something that is still an aspect of the storytelling in, in Star Wars. Look at Kylo Ren's new lightsaber. In fact, there was new information that just came out of this uh, this past week from Entertainment Weekly about how this tells us something about this, this main character. Looking at his lightsaber, there's none other uh, like it. And this is tied into the tradition of storytelling that comes from um, the shift from the Western to the science fiction, from young people wanting to be the hero Charlie Seringo to young people wanting to be the hero Thomas Edison. Well, science fiction literature thrived. It, it grew up from the Edison Aid with the themes of the Edison Aid, so you have Inventors series, Young Inventors, The Radio Boys, The Radio Girls, ultimately the phenomenally popular for, for younger readers, Tom Swift series, um, which ends up with uh, a, a, an amazing number of books, like 103 books, I think, in the series, ultimately. Um, in 1929, for example, a U.S. study found that the Tom Swift series was second in popularity in the United States, only to the Bible um, for young readers. But the pulps were also, even though they were still skewed for um, younger readers, and their artwork certainly reflected this, pulp novels and such were also very, very much uh, adult storytelling vessels as well. And I want to talk about uh, two examples here as I start to wrap up my, my talk. Um, 
there was, for example, the phenomenal success of E.E. E. Doc Smith's Lensman series, a series of pulp novels. Um, this was actually uh, a runner-up for the Hugo Award for the best all-time science fiction series. The winner was the Foundation series by Asimov. Uh, this included four novels, uh, um, originally Galactic Patrol, Grey Lensman, Second Stage Lensman and Children of the Lens, published between 37 and 48, and then ultimately um, th there would be a work retrofitted in that and, and another work uh, written into that, it's ultimately six serialized novels. Very much a takeoff of the Edison Aid. If you watch the episode one Star Wars web documentary, look at the bookshelves behind George Lucas's shoulder in his writing room, and you can see E.E. E. Doc Smith's Lensman series there. Uh, it's interesting, you know how some authors have pet words, and if you see a word repeated several times, you go, I know who wrote that, because I know the author who just uses that word all the time. Well, E.E. E. Doc Smith had uh, a few pet words, and one of them, interestingly enough, was coruscant. Coruscant means shiny, and there were lots of shiny things in the Lensman series. If you look at that word, spelled exactly as it is spelled, coruscant, and you pronounce it differently, you get Coruscant. Coruscant, the capital planet of the Galactic Republic, the home of the Jedi Temple, and the setting for a lot of the action in the prequel uh, series from E.E. E. Doc Smith. Here I want to quote from Stephen Hart, a novel, a uh, novel, an, an uh, essay in Salon from 2002. And he was in this essay calling George Lucas to task for not giving enough credit to the science fiction books that got him where he was. And in this essay, um, Stephen Hart says, uh, comparing Star Wars and the Lensman series, like the Jedi, Lensman enforce order throughout the galaxy with an arsenal of paranormal powers that render them virtually invincible in combat. Where Jedi pay homage to the Force, Lensman invoke the cosmic all. Lucas's Jedi get their Force quotient boosted by microscopic entities called midichlorians. Smith's heroes are turbocharged by lenses. Collections of crystalline, semi-sentient life forms attuned to their personalities. An early draft of Star Wars revolved around the search for the Kyber crystal, which sounds an awful lot like one of Smith's lenses. There are even hints that Lucas has worked a Lensman-style breeding program into his saga, judging from the story of Anakin Skywalker's Immaculate Conception in the first episode in um, The Phantom Menace. So he goes on to sort of trace other ways that the Lensman comes, uh, seems, seems to resonate with Star Wars. The scale of the action in the Lensman books is broader than anything in the Lucas universe. Not content with wiping out whole planets, Smith's Lensman detonate entire solar systems without breaking a sweat. The series underwent a successful paperback revival in the early 1970s, when Lucas was sweating out the first drafts of Star Wars. Dave Pollock's biography, Skywalking, The Lives, Life and Films of George Lucas, puts the Lensman novels on the top of Lucas's pre-Star Wars reading list. There's another pulp I want to underscore, uh, pulp note, particularly pulp author. One of the first ladies of pulp science fiction, still very much telling, uh, a, ter telling a kind of Edison Aid story, often with, uh, with women protagonists, Lee Brackett, who lived from 1915 to 1978. Her first published science fiction was Martian Quest in uh, the February 1940 issue of Astounding Science Fiction. She alternated back and forth between writing science fiction and screenwriting. How good was she? Well, she worked with William Faulkner to write the script for The Big Sleep in 1946, the famous Bogey and McCall film. Uh, in fact, she had to leave one of her science fiction stories sort of unfinished in order to go do this, so she asked her uh, protege, Ray Bradbury, to finish it for her. She also co-wrote several John Wayne 
films done by Ford, including Rio Bravo in 59. Keeps coming back to the Western. She dealt with a lot of social themes, including uh, colonialism and including um, how power attracted the power hungry. One of her best known works is the great novel uh, The Long Tomorrow, 1955, which is an apocalyptic story about uh, nuclear warfare. She wrote over 50 science fiction stories, 10 science fiction novels from the 40s to the 70s. Do you know what her last job was? Well, she was hired to write the script for Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, because of Lucas's appreciation for her pulp SF work. And she wrote the first draft, and unfortunately, very, very shortly after she turned that in, she died. We really don't have a sense how great her contribution was, although it it is worth pointing out that, uh, that many critics and scholars do think Empire Strikes Back is the best of the six films to date. We do know that Lucas wanted certain parts uh, vastly rewritten, but part of that is on Lucas because in all of the, the story meetings that he had with Brackett, he, he left out one little, uh, little bit of a <laughs> plot point that might have been helpful to her. He mentioned that he wanted to have Luke Skywalker's father in the film, and he wanted to have Darth Vader in the film, but he somehow never told her that Darth Vader was Luke's father. In fact, he hadn't really decided that yet until he got to playing with a, a later draft of the script. So, <laughs> of course, her script didn't automatically then become what we saw on screen because that, you know, not her bed, that's, that's on Lucas, but a lot of her other um, character work and such um, may very well have translated. It speaks highly to the fact that Lucas was influenced, though, by Paul. And obviously, and this is probably a connection that a lot of you already know, when Lucas pitched Star Wars to potential investors, to studios, even to members of his own creative team, his refrain was the same. He wanted to make a modern Flash Gordon. In fact, he first tried the rights to get to remake Flash Gordon, couldn't get them, another filmmaker had them, and so then he decided he would create his own Flash Gordon. Reading the comics, and especially watching the serials, were a huge part of his childhood. You can see Queen, see Queen Priya there on the left, and you can see where Leia got her buns. He bonded with friends in film school over the Flash Gordon serials, their mutual love of Flash Gordon. He even arranged viewing parties for people to come and enjoy Flash Gordon. Now, Flash Gordon began in 1934 in comic form. He was sort of the child of Buck Rogers, who was already a comic strip phenomenon, and John Carter's of Mars, or John Carter of Mars, I should say, the science fiction pulp series by Edgar Rice Burroughs, those novels of action and adventure. It's very well received. It uh, followed the handsome, young, uh, American uh, recent graduate of Yale University where he played polo. He gets sort of swept up in this invention with the smart and com uh, completely competent and, and often sassy Dale Arden and the mentor figure, the scientific guru, Dr. Zarkov. Originally, it starts out with uh, the, the planet Mongo in a kind of um, intercept orbit that is going to collide with Earth, and the three of them end up in, uh, in space in a ship that, um, that the doctor has invented in order to uh, avert disaster, and things go on and on from there. They find Ming the Mer Merciless, who is the, the evil ruler of Mongo, and uh, there are all sorts of adventures that follow with very exotic locales. They create a kind of um, federation, a kind of gang of good people, of, of like-minded rebels who are trying to fight the evil dark forces. They became a series of films with Buster Crab in the lead role. Flash Gordon in 36, Flash Gordon's trip to Mars in 38, and Flash Gordon conquers the universe in 1940. They would then be condensed into feature film-length uh, films, 
they would also uh, be shown on television, which is one of the first places that Lucas discovered them. What did Lucas take away from these stories? Exotic locations, shark men, sea beasts, fire dragons, different worlds with different societies. You have Queen Freya there from the ice kingdom of Phrygia. You have alliances with heroic fellows, travelers, uh, other comrades in arms, men and women, constant action, cliffhangers. It's worth pointing out that these originally had 12 different episodes in each serial. And in early interviews with George Lucas, once he realized Star Wars had legs and was successful, he talked about Star Wars being the adventures of Luke Skywalker, and he would make 12 films of them. He was thinking very much in the 12-story motif that he gleaned from the serials. Specifically, Visually, from the, the Flash Gordon serials, you have the long text crawl at the beginning. He, George Lucas steals that, tells you where you've been, and sets up the action for the next installment. Also, the scene wipe, where a bar comes across and one scene becomes another, straight out of Flash Gordon. And, yes, Leia's hairstyles. And later, some of Amidala's as well. Both the comics and the film serials also inspired marketing, including all kinds of things that really hadn't been tied to television before, um, or to film, or to comics, or for that matter, any kind of storytelling like this. There were pop-up books, and coloring books, and toy spaceships, and ray guns, and, and really the only thing comparable were the kinds of of packaging and promotions and marketing done for, guess what, westerns. Westerns like, for example, The Lone Ranger, where you could get bows and arrows and guns and masks and cowboy hats and such to, to, uh, to similarly play out the universe. Lastly, something similar that he pulled from the Flash Gordon universe, some of the lessons we also learn from Charlie Seringo that a green and experienced youth can go out and discover a wider world and actually make a difference in it. That there is a clear demarcation between good and bad. Even when good guys are doing things that seem kind of bad, even when bad guys try to fool us by doing something good, we always know who it is that we are rooting for. And the larger question, if not us, then who? There are wrongs that need to be righted. We don't wait for someone to come take care of us. We don't wait for the universe somehow to be balanced. We go out and we try to make it happen ourselves. And that brings us full circle from science fiction pulps through Thomas Edison back to the American Western. And so I'd like to end with one last film visual. Remember how we started with lone Luke Skywalker looking out onto the vast sands of Tatooine and those binary suns setting. We have talked about the way that this kind of comes back around. This time I want to end with a film close to George Lucas uh, and, for that matter, Akira Kurosawa, John Ford's iconic western, The Searchers, from 1956. There's this repeated motif, the cowboy is necessary, only he can do the dirty work to make civilization possible. But the civilization that he enables has no place for him. He is by nature alone, on a quest, going out into a wider world, not a safe one, a dangerous one. He's going into the sunset, maybe even a binary sunset. We see at the end, the family reunited thanks to John Wayne, and they are there in their comfortable home. But John Wayne can't come in. He doesn't ever set foot in the home. He goes back out. His work isn't done. He's got other adventures to have. And he walks out there into that desert, that vast space. He's the small individual. There is that vast, inhospitable place around him. And he is wistful. He is yearning. He is defiant. One of the repeated motifs of Star Wars that I find meaningful is of the Lone Jedi. Yoda, laying low in the swamps of Dagobah after Order 66 has exterminated most of the Jedi. 
just waiting until he's needed again. Qui-Gon Jinn, set apart and in conflict with the Jedi Council, cut off from everything but his own meditation before confronting Darth Maul. Kanan Jarrus from Rebels, never staying anywhere long, hiding his identity and trying to lose himself in the larger galaxy, leaving as soon as anyone might guess his Jedi training and background. Ahsoka Tano from Clone Wars, walking away from the Jedi Temple on her own. Obi-Wan Kenobi, turned to crazy old Ben the Hermit, watching Luke Skywalker from afar. And if we can extrapolate from the trailers and behind the scenes clips we've seen thus far for Star Wars The Force Awakens, Luke Skywalker himself, perhaps, now in self-imposed exile. I hope we will find him in December. And I hope you've enjoyed this presentation even a fraction as much as I have enjoyed speaking with you. I'd like to invite all of you to consider spending more time in a conversation about Star Wars. If you're interested, we've got 12 weeks of that coming up. But whether you will join us or not, I just want to thank you so much uh, for your time and for your attention here today. And if there are uh, questions, I know I've run over a bit, but if there are questions, I am happy to take them. So let us see. I don't know if Serena is back on now or not. Yes, there she is. Serena. Back again, <laughs> recovered from the red and blue screen. <laughs> you do have some questions coming through here, Amy. Do you want to read them, or do you want me to read them, some out to you? Um, let's see. I can if they're there. I'm I'm happy to do that unless you just like to to vet them. I'm glad to to go okay, here. Okay, sure. Um, well, I'll take advantage and ask you one to begin with myself because I have one that's a little too long to type out. Um, and just thank you for that amazing presentation. So good. Um, influences I had never thought of. Such so educational, which kind of leads to my question because you've presented this huge set of influences and cultural products that came into Star Wars. We could also study another whole set of cultural influences, which are the ancient myths and archetypes. So, here, let me see if I can formulate the question fairly well. So Star Wars then is made up of all these bits and pieces. It's all these puzzle pieces that come from American culture, Japanese film, Greek and Roman myth. And yet, at least the best episodes of it feel like unified pieces of art themselves. They, so they have both of those pieces of appeal. They have the timeless archetypes and the sense of being one new story. Could you talk a little bit about how you think they achieve that? How are they both a grab bag of all this popular stuff, but also a consistent work of art? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I would draw a connection or a parallel, I think, um, if, if, if everyone will allow me to and forgive me for it, um, with, with Harry Potter. I think, there are, I think there's a lot of reasons to make, to make comparisons between the two. And the, perhaps the biggest one is, that um, that both Star Wars and Harry Potter have been texts that entire generations and now multiple generations have identified with that are common languages. People globally, you can go anywhere and, and say Star Wars or Harry Potter and they know what you're talking about. And I, I think both of those achieve the same thing. And, and that is they do. It's a, like you said. It's a grab bag. These these works are are cultural literacy tests because there are so many influences that go into them in the writing of them, in the visuals, it, costuming, everything, naming, you name it. But but those aspects of uh, of story work because the creators are using. These, these building blocks that have been around time-tested for so very long. They speak to us for some reason. Now, we could, we could debate what the reasons are, and, and certainly um, there are, you know, we can go all Joseph Campbell on it and say that there's this sort of monomyth we keep telling ourselves over and over again. Um, we, could, we could pull from some of the things that Star Wars pulls from, from the, for example, the Buddhist traditions, and, and say, you know, there's, there's spiritual reasons we need these stories, but however you, you frame it, these creators are, are pulling from, some, from, from traditions that had these time-honored deals that are 
completed over, over uh, generations in different places, um, in different eras, uh, to, to strike a chord with us, something that is deeper than the, the immediate um, context that has created our tastes. There's something much more fundamental uh, about, about these building blocks of story that we react to. And so I think the genius is to be able to, to take these different building blocks of story from, from, from different traditions, create a larger, um, coherent tale, and then share it in such a way that it strikes the same chords that each of those individual building blocks strikes, and yet feels fresh. Um, how does Star Wars do that? I think it's much more than just George Lucas's vision. I think it's the, the artists um, that, that helped him tell the story visually. I think it's the script writers, particularly in the first trilogy of films, that, uh, that, that, that gave us characters and dialogue that we are, continue to be part of our uh, you know, daily conversation um, uh, on a regular basis. There's also the um, uh, the novels and the the stories, the television series, the comics. Those creators too are are pulling from a a, a central core vision and adding to it. And I think when we take the best of all of that, we see that there's there's freshness in the storytelling, but there's really something very age old in. Um, in what's speaking to us as human beings. That doesn't really answer your question because if I knew exactly how to do it, I would be doing it right now. <laughs> I would be doing it right now. But I can see at least in those two franchises or those two sagas that there is um, an appreciation that these parts of story work for a reason. And 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 Rowling also calls that the the intellectual compost heap in her mind. She says she can't even figure out sometimes which particular influence leads her to a particular idea. These things have just all blended together in her soul, and she knows what speaks to her. And perhaps that's part of it. Part, that's perhaps part of the genius of, of uh, an artistry of storytelling. What speaks to you, you trust, will also speak to others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the old and the new coming together in a new texture, right. Well, several of the questions coming through have to do with that, with some part of the old or the new. Here's a fascinating one from Lydia Bangston. She asks, each of the different frontiers depicted in pulp literature, the Wild West, the rising science and technology, were directly linked to the pressing issues in their societies at the time. What would you say is the current frontier facing our society? Oh, that's Excellent one. That's an excellent one. Um, I would have to think long and hard about that to give you to give you a great uh, to give you a great answer. Although I suppose my um, my knee jerk reaction would be it, it would somehow come in the form of an answer to the question why aren't we already in the stars? And I think part of that is there's a lot of stuff on our planet we haven't really figured out yet, like how to live with each other <laughs> without different groups trying to kill each other, uh, for instance. Um, I do know that that is very true for Star Wars, that at different times Star Wars has been reacting to immediate concerns in society, uh, whether that was uh, uh, George Lucas was deeply influenced by um, the, the phenomenon of the, of the Vietnam conflict and Star Wars came immediately out of that. He was up for Apocalypse Now, actually, to direct Apocalypse Now. And uh, he he ended up directing Star Wars, creating and directing Star Wars. And in a way, the Star Wars, the first trilogy, is his apocalypse now. Um, he's responding to a lot of things that he was very concerned about, uh, not just Vietnam itself, but also Watergate. But then you can see in the second uh, trilogy the concern about how a republic becomes an empire. And uh, right there's the the classic. Uh, line by Padme Amidala, this is the way that uh, liberty ends with, with thunderous applause, um, that you, know, you don't have to have a, an evil outside uh, a dictator come in and rip your, your rights away, you'll happily give them away. Uh, concerns about very much uh, how um, free so societies stay free or don't. Uh, there are, interesting questions now um, that are being raised 
don't exactly know where they're going to go, but there's been enough in uh, the teasers and trailers and behind the scenes stuff to suggest that there's some going to be some interesting things in the new uh, films. And certainly, for example, um, Star Wars Rebels right now, even though it's it's on uh, um, marketed to a younger audience, is dealing with some very interesting questions um, about identity and about um, the legacy of war and how you try to heal that and when it's appropriate to rebel and and how you're supposed to think of yourself as a, as an individual and a member of a group and as a citizen and all sorts of things that are that are quite interesting it remains a very political uh, text but I think also there's a gift in in the Star Wars storytelling of, of coming from very specific, points and yet making such general, um, in, uh, giving such general insights and making such uh, general um, statements that people in other contexts can also appreciate them. So you didn't have to live during the Vietnam conflict or, um, or in a U.S. context with um, uh, Watergate to appreciate some of the interesting things that are going on in the original trilogy. Or you don't have to even be in a, a native English speaker to appreciate things that are going on. So it's it's broader than those things. It will be interesting to see if Star Wars, um, how Star Wars evolves to address some of the big questions today. But I, I would say one of them is just um, uh, the conflict on on the planet today in terms of of uh, those societies who who find a way to exist uh, coexist uh, in some sort of you know mutual respect and harmony and those that um, that don't and and how we're supposed to understand our roles um, in in that kind of uh, climate so that that we as a species can perhaps uh, do more Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm fascinated to see that too. Here are two other specific cultural issues that are raised. Suzanne Hartwick asks a good kind of Marxist question, uh, responding to the technological hero that you were describing, who is skilled at technology, but part of their transformation into adulthood in the wider world is to create and personalize their technology, right? So to have this identity, this kind of craftsmanship relationship. So then Suzanne asks, is there some sort of tension between this and the mass production that Edison also enabled, right? Is there an alienation from their labor? What do you think about that? Oh, that's very interesting. There, there is, um, in the sense of, well, there, there was a, always a tension in mass production. I mean, we even see that the way that plays out with, say, Brave New World and how uh, Ford is set up as, you know, the god of Brave New World and so humans are manufactured. There's a, a fear that that what has been done for efficiency might then become um, something that is simply uh, not liberating us, but actually making us all the same. And what does that mean? And I think Star Wars has addressed that in some really interesting ways, particularly through the question of clones. So even when you have the clones created for the clone army, uh, initially all you see are the same things, these mass-produced uh, people who are all set. Um, but they're not fit. They're, they're these quickly grown and disposable human beings, and how are we supposed to feel about that? But yet, if you watch, for example, Clone Wars, you can see slowly each of those clones trying to create their own identity. So they start wearing their hair differently. They start differentiating themselves. I think that's sort of the latest version of the Edison Age, or the way, uh, for example, the way that, that the clones in the Clone Wars are making themselves as their own product. They have been mass produced, but the way they sort of own themselves, not as labor, but as, as the product themselves, is to differentiate between themselves in certain ways and still have that individualization, even though they were made um, not to be individuals at all. I, I, I think I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not Marxist, so I'm not going to have the same sort of, of, of um, perspective on the whole labor question, but I think one of the things that comes across with what, um, the things that Edison produced was that those things could then go on and be um, adapted into a variety of different kinds of things. So he, those products weren't the end piece. They were then something, because we, we have 
uh, electricity, then we do this, or then we take electricity and use it this way that he didn't anticipate, or um, then what's the next stage? It's not, it's not a static equation. It's a constant innovation and constant change and constant um, uh, uh, evolution of this sort of thing. And there's always effects that people don't anticipate and there's also always kind of an entrepreneurial thing going on that makes things different. Um, and again that brings us back to the clones too. Um, there's unintended consequences um, that uh, even when the intention is to do something that is um, very clear-cut and the, then the process is over. The process isn't over because individuals do things individually and uh, and even clones do it as well. So I'm not sure that answers the question, but from a theoretical standpoint, I kind of uh, would would take that in a slightly different direction. Right, that's certainly a good example of the way those two perspectives on technology are dramatized in Star Wars. All right, maybe we have time for just one final question on one last issue. So Aaron Masters asks, do you see a connection between Star Wars and the tradition of the Western in terms of the depiction of female characters and female social roles? Oh, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. And that's something that's been debated throughout the Star Wars, um, the evolution of Star Wars storytelling, because of course, there are things that can be um, praised about the centrality of certain women characters, and there's also a lot of things that can be quite rightly criticized about the way we view uh, some of the women characters. And that's something also that I think is going to be very interesting to see when we see these uh, uh, these new films, both both the um, <clears throat> the Force Awakens and also Rogue One, um, not this year but next year what those uh, female leads look like and what their roles are. The Western is sort of, um, there is, in in the Western storytelling and in um, film, there's sort of a, a disconnect, and part of that is because film comes after the, after the literature. Uh, what do you do with, with, a lot of the early Western stories just didn't have women. Um, or if they did, they were sort of the woman in peril who then needs to be rescued, and, and she serves a plot point, and that's pretty much it. But of course, these were also stories written primarily for adolescent um, uh, young guys, and, uh, and they just wanted to get on to more fighting, right? But by the time you get to Western cinema, there's some very interesting um, uh, women characters. And of course, the real history of the West uh, uh, is... is uh, full of uh, inspiring and fascinating and complicated and uh, complex stories about women and how they negotiated spaces in um, in the on the frontier. And I think works like well uh, to to take a, a current television series, Hell on Wheels, does a very good job of of showing that the story of the West was as much a story about women as it was about men. But but. There has been a tradition um, in terms of both the literature and, and the film, less in the film, but certainly still in the film, of not really knowing what to do with, with uh, uh, female characters. And people will critique aspects of the Star Wars universe in the same way. I think it is an evolving one, and I think there have been some very, very complex and interesting women in the Star Wars universe. Um, but it is a challenge that it needs to sort of uh, uh, meet in the new texts that come along. I think uh, right now Rebels is doing a very good job of that. And I think uh, what we have seen so far from The Force Awakens suggests that there's, there's a great appreciation that um, there needs to be a better balance in the Star Wars universe. Um, but part of that is also you know, um, about the culture sort of uh, uh, being being receptive to that. I mean, why do we think of of Carrie Fisher in a metal bikini and say she's uh, Leia the slave girl and not Leia the hut slayer, right? Um, <laughs> it's a matter of perception, too, from a certain point of view, as Obi-Wan Kenobi would say. So I think that's also a um, challenge to us as viewers, uh, consumers, and um, and analyzers of the text um, to kind of question what we're bringing to it as well as what uh, what the texts are themselves.
Great question. Well, thank you, and great answer. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for your great questions. And thank you, Amy, so much for a really enlightening talk. That was so much fun. So I'll close us off with some announcements, since I didn't get to do those at the beginning. And the first, of course, is what Amy has already shared, which is her class coming up on Star Wars. So I hope that very many of you will consider taking that course. And there are two other exciting classes being offered through the Mythgard Institute this fall. The other is Anglo-Saxon. And that's being taught by Michael Drought and Nelson Goering. And there's also Tolkien and the Great War, taught by John Garth. So please do check out those classes, which you can take for credit or for audit, depending on your situation. And while you're there on MythGuard.org, take a look at the other upcoming guest lecturers. We have Tom Shippey coming back to speak in the fall. He just taught our excellent Beowulf course in the spring and in September on September the 10th at 4 p.m. he will be speaking to us and there's a description of his lecture on the website and then in October we will close out the 2015 guest lecture series with the Reverend Dr. Malcolm Geit, priest, poet, and rock and roller and he'll be talking about fantasy and theology. There are other things you can check out while you're on the MythGuard.org website as well, such as the Silmarillion Film Project, the free course on the Lays of Beleriand. So thanks again, everybody, for being here today. Thank you, Amy, and I hope to see you all again on September 10th. Bye-bye.